Yo, what's up, everybody? It's good to have everybody in. This is Mr. Nixon, and uh, we're trying out our Google Plus Hangout. You know, the Google Plus Hangout is pretty cool because they can go one or two different ways. You can have the um, you can have the um, Google Plus Hangout where you can see me, and you're basically watching a recording which is what you're doing right now or we can have the Google Plus Hangout where you guys are actually interacting with me the same time that I'm in here talking and uh, we're going to try both we're going to do some uh, we're going to do some interactive hangouts where you guys are on a group chat setting and I'm on on the other line and then we'll have several that are done like this right now where you guys are just kind of watching me. Now, if you're looking at me and you're like, is he in the bathroom? I mean, where the heck is he? I'm actually at my office at home. This is a nice little cozy place where I like to sit and think sometimes. I do some of my recording. So literally, I'm kind of sitting in my favorite place on the floor in my office at home, kind of chilling. So people ask me that question all the time. Is he really in the bathroom? No, no, it's, it's not the bathroom. This is my office. I'm um, looking over here at my X-Men poster that was signed by the actual writers who created Wolverine and Storm and Colossus and Magneto and looking at a couple of desks and different things in here. It's kind of a good place to like let my brain zone out and get some good thoughts in. Well, anyway, enough about where I am and what's going on. Let's talk about this chapter one. And kind of break down some stuff. Chapter one is uh, is not really all that exciting because it's real basic. There's a lot of things to memorize as far as words are concerned, but there are some key concepts that kind of catch people off guard at first. Uh, people have trouble kind of taking chapter one and riding with it. You know, some science classes, what you learn in chapter one, you might have to use it for about two or three more chapters, and then you never see the concept again. Not chapter one in anatomy and physiology. In chapter one in anatomy and physiology, what you're going to learn in chapter one, you are going to use for the rest of 210 and the rest of 211, I promise you. And you're going to see it constantly. And I'm going to be the aggravating guy who's going to constantly be reminding you, oh, yeah, remember we talked about this in chapter one. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 I do remember that, All right? So, uh, we're going to talk about a few concepts tonight. There are some things that I'm going to skip over. I'm not going to skip over them because they're not important. I'm going to skip over them because you guys can read and reading is fundamental. Uh, there's no need for me to read off of the screen and read off of a slide that you can read and memorize on your own. That's a waste of your time. What I want to concentrate on is I want to concentrate on some of those images and some of those concepts that sometimes people don't really wrap their head around too well. So. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change what you see on your screen. I'm going to open up the Screen Share app, and uh, we are going to go straight to um, full screen. I'm going to pull up PowerPoint, and hopefully you're going to be able to see exactly what I'm seeing, and we're going to start this slideshow. Uh, right now. Okay, hopefully you guys are seeing this. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to go back and check this and make sure that everybody's seeing what I'm seeing. I'm kind of starting with slide number two. Feel free to pause this thing and pull up your slides. Um, if you don't have the slides, please pause. Go and pull out the slides. If not, if not, if you don't want to pause, you don't have to, you can take some relatively good notes. And just follow along with me. Just follow the bouncing screen as I go along. Now I kind of want to start with uh, slide two, where it says the sciences of anatomy and physiology. You know, in this class, we call it Bio 210 Anatomy and Physiology 1. So oftentimes, people think of anatomy and physiology as one and the same, but they're not. They're actually two different studies that are actually put together. And we tend to study them together, although we can study them separately, like in lab. In lab, you guys will be doing more anatomy. In lecture with me, you'll be doing more physiology. Now, 
But here's something you got to keep in mind. Anatomy is the study of a, a way a thing looks. It's the form of a thing. It's the structure of a thing. It's how a thing looks. It's how it's shaped. It's, it's where it's located. So if you're studying the anatomy of the liver, you look at how a liver looks. You uh, look at where the liver is located in the body. I don't know if you guys in lab have already talked about quadrants and if you talked about regions, but if you talked about quadrants and regions, you should be able to know where the liver is located as far as a quadrant in a region. We know that the liver is located inferior. Oh, there are those terms that you probably learned in lab. The liver is inferior to the diaphragm. And so he's not in the thoracic cavity, but instead the liver is located in the abdominal cavity. Um, and so we see the liver also, it's, it's, to the, uh, it's lateral to the stomach. So we get a chance to use a lot of those terms and a lot of those regions and quadrant names and, and locations when we talk about anatomy. But when we talk about physiology, we're all about function. How does the darn thing work? Well, what does your liver do? Well, actually, there's like 20 different things that your liver does that are essential functions that you actually could not live without. One of the functions that your liver deals with on a day-to-day -day basis is the doggone thing makes bile, B-I-L-E, which bile is stored in your gallbladder and it's used to do what they call emulsify fats. In other words, it kind of acts like soap in, the, in a greasy bowl. If you put soap in a greasy bowl, it winds up emulsifying the fat, the grease in the bowl. It makes it easier for you to be able to wash the grease out of the bowl. If you've ever had a greasy pan and you pour water in it, the water just rolls right off. The grease floats on the water, makes a nasty wet mess. But if you put soap in there, it cuts through the grease, dislodges the grease from the pan, and allows you to be able to separate the grease from the pan and clean the doggone thing. Well, bile produced by your liver does the exact same thing. It separates oil and fats when you digest them. It makes it easier for you to break them down and absorb them. Perfect for a fish fry. Let's take my word for it. So you can kind of see, you know, we talked about just now, you know, the anatomy of a liver. And those are things that you were familiar with, uh, you know, or, or things that you're becoming familiar with this first week in class. But then we talked about the function of the liver. And, and, and I mean, we just went a total different direction with the function of the liver. So you kind of see how anatomy and physiology can be separate a lot. But then again, you can also see how anatomy and physiology can be be inseparable, where, where you kind of have to put the two of them together to kind of really understand how they work. I got a story for you. So I've got this, uh, you know, I had a birthday party one time, uh, just a few years ago, and uh, we had a lot of people over to the house, and uh, some, some friends of ours, they had a little four-year-old, and I noticed that the four-year-old was walking up to one of the light panels in the living room and pulled out a screwdriver and for, you know, proceeded to take the bolts out of the doggone panel to remove the panel off the light switch. And so I walked up to him, and I was like, Samuel? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, Samuel, what are you doing? I, don't do that. He said, oh. I'm like, no, really, don't, don't do that. Samuel, huh? I need you to put the panel and the screws back. He said, okay. Well, he takes the screwdriver, puts the screws back into the panel, and then he, he looked at me, and he says, and what about these? And he pulls out his pocket, and he has a handful of screws. This little four-year-old had been walking through my house my entire birthday party and had been taking out all the screws out of every light panel throughout the house. So this, this dude goes back, and he puts all the screws back in every single panel. It was amazing. Now, just the fact that his little four-year-old mind, when I walked back to find where he got the screwdriver from, he got the screwdriver actually from one of my um, tool chests. And in this tool chest, dude, I'm telling you, I've got all types of different small tools in this tool chest. But somehow he figured out the exact screwdriver that would fit those exact uh, screws in those light panels. He knew he matched the anatomy to the physiology of that screwdriver. He knew that the anatomy, the structure of that screwdriver, fit those screws in those panels and he maximized the function or the physiology of those screwdriver of that screwdriver by pulling each one of those screws 
out of all those panels. The anatomy of that screwdriver dictated the physiology of that screwdriver. In other words, you would not take a screwdriver and use it to hammer a nail into a board of wood. You just wouldn't because the anatomy of that screwdriver dictates the physiology of that screwdriver. And that's something you want to always remember while you're going through 210 and 211. The anatomy of a thing can, can shine light on the physiology of that thing and vice versa. The two of them always go together. They're, they're quite inseparable. So, so don't forget that. Let's skip some of these guys because these are things that you can read and you can learn and you can memorize. They're actually pretty interesting to read about. Blah, blah, blah. Patho uh, pathologic anatomy, radiographic uh, anatomy, um, radio radiographic anatomy, excuse me. And, and there's all these different anatomies and then you're going to skip and you're going to go a little further on and you're going to find different types of physiology, neurophysiology, respiratory physiology, pathophysiology. And these are things that you can read as well. What I really want to get into is I want to get into this slide, which talks about the integration of anatomy and physiology. Now, I'm going to warn you. You see this example that I've got in the notes? This example is something that you're going to see in 211, like this slide. You're really actually going to have to learn this in 211. You'll be tested in it in 211, even if you don't take me for 211. Someone's going to talk about this in 211, all right? This is an example of seeing anatomy and physiology work hand in hand. I mean, anatomy and physiology are like the Wonder Twin Powers, and when they activate, they make a lot of magical things happen when you're talking about the body. The example here is talking about the small sacs in your lungs called alveoli. Now, alveoli are little small air sacs in your lungs that allow oxygen and carbon dioxide to enter and exit your bloodstream. So basically you've got these inside your lungs. I, I know you looked at a model of the lungs in lab. You were probably fascinated at how large the lungs looked in, you, in your body and how massive the lungs are in your chest cavity and the fact that your lungs take up the majority of your thoracic cavity. That's amazing and wonderful, but I'm here to tell you that if I took an adult lung out of their chest and put it in your bathtub, it would float. Okay, There's not a lot to your lungs. As a matter of fact, I hate to break your heart, but your lungs are not the real reason that you breathe. Really, it's respiratory muscles, but that's another story for another day, okay? So your lungs by themselves don't do anything. Your lungs are nothing more than uh, they are exchange, they are exchange locations. That, that's all they are. They are like um, a farmer's market. They are places where you exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. That is it. And so when you learn about the alveoli, you find out that the alveoli are like one cell thick. That they are extremely thin. And you learn as time goes on, and you're going to learn this with the tissues when we get to chapter 5, you're going to find that things that are one cell thick are very unique structures. As a matter of fact, you find out that alveoli are not just one cell thick, but you find out that the cells that make alveoli are flat. So not only is it one cell thick, but they're also flat. So these air sacs are as thin as you humanly can possibly get them, which you'll also find out that because they're so thin, oxygen can go out of alveoli and into your blood, and carbon dioxide can go out of your blood and into the alveoli. So when you exhale and you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide, but you inhale oxygen. It's an absolutely amazing fact. This is what we call interrelatedness between anatomy and physiology. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was giving a speech a long time and he talked about the law of interrelatedness. And we see it here once again with the whole human body. All 11 organ systems of your body are interrelated with one another. You can't survive without one. You can't survive without all of your organ systems. If I take one of your organ systems away, the other 10 will suffer for it. And in anatomy and physiology, it's okay to learn things separately, but you have to keep in mind that at some point in time, they will overlap. They will exchange with one another. And these organs, these tissues, these cells, these organ systems, they will have to integrate with one another. They will have to interrelate with one another. They will work together in some shape, form, or fashion. 
you better keep that in mind because I can tell you we're going to start slow, but then when we speed up, we're going to really be running. So we can see here there's a comparison of anatomy and physiology. It shows what the anatomist will see when they describe the organ. And then it shows on the right how the physiologist describes the organ. And the biggest thing that you're going to notice is that when an anatomist describes an organ, they, uh, they look at it and they start naming structures and they start naming where the thing is and they talk about what it's made out of and when you talk about physiologists they talk to you about how it works for example here are two people talking about muscles in the thigh so they're probably talking about your quadriceps the morris muscles or they're probably talking about your your hamstrings or your adductors but the bottom line is the anatomists when they start looking at the muscles in your thigh they talk about how it's made out of muscle tissue well, that's not a function, that's structure. It's what it's made out of. It receives innervation from the somatic motor neurons, and these muscles include the quadriceps femoris and the hamstrings, which are designed to extend and flex the knee, respectively. Now, it sounds like they're talking about the function, but no, they're not really talking about the function too much. They're just talking about an action that occurs because of the physical structures that are there. But when you read what a physiologist thinks about the muscles, it talks about that they contract voluntarily via the nerve impulses or action potentials from somatic motor neurons. Oh, they just got deep. The muscles are designed to provide enough power to move the parts of the lower limbs during a foot race. They really start getting into the specific functions there. Now, when you want to apply this to the class that you're in right now, in lab, you're going to learn the muscles of the thigh. You're going to learn about the... Um, rectus femoris and the vastus medialis and the vastus lateralis and the vastus intermedius. You're going to learn about the hamstring muscles with the biceps femoris. Uh, you're going to learn about all those guys, uh, the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. You're going to learn about all those muscles in lab and then you're going to come back in here and lecture with me in the physiology side and we're going to talk about how that muscle actually moves. We'll talk about why calcium is so important to a muscle. We'll talk about why why sodium and potassium are so important to a muscle cell. We will talk about um, why protein is so important to a muscle cell. Actin and myosin and all the different things that happen inside of a muscle cell just so you can contract, so you can lift that spoon of butter pecan ice cream up to your mouth. Uh, I guess, you know, I ran out of butter pecan ice cream, so it's been on my mind lately, but I'll be hitting the store tomorrow. Anyway, so let's keep going. So uh, this is a picture that, unfortunately, I could not fit on two slides. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, fit on one slide, I, I mean. Uh, so you can see it's divided up into two slides. I hate that. This is figure 1.1a. You can take a look at this in your text message. It's a really complex, complicated-looking picture. Most people, when they look at it, they're like, what in the world am I looking at? Well, you're looking at a guy eating some food. I don't know what he has there. Um, I don't know. It looks like White Castle as far as the bag is concerned. But uh, maybe Jack in the Box, but you know, the top should have been red. Anyway, so he's eating his burger, right? And it's showing it go into his digestive tract, and you can see it traveling through. The point of this matter is to show you how a physiologist looks at things. And how an anatomist looks at things. You know, a physiologist is going to look at this and, and an anatomist is going to look at this in two totally different respects. The anatomist is going to point out the small intestine and they're going to talk about how many walls it has. And it's going to talk about the, the villi that are lining the walls. And it's going to talk about the muscle layer. And it's going to talk about the cells that are lining the small intestine. That's what an anatomist is going to talk about. Whereas a physiologist, is going to talk about function. The physiologist is going to tell you, well, actually, let me, back, let me back up. The anatomist in this picture, when they see a small intestine, the anatomist is going to tell you that the small intestine is nearly 20 feet long. The anatomist is going to tell you that it's made up of three parts, the duodenum or the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. They're going to tell you that the duodenum or duodenum, however you want to pronounce it, is only about 10 inches long. They're going to tell you that the jejunum is somewhere around over 8 feet long and they're going to tell you that the ilium is over 11 feet long and that that's a whole lot of chitlins. All right? So you got about 20 feet of small intestine wrapped up all inside of you 
and it's made of multiple uh, tissue layers there, including a muscular layer that helps propel food like the way that you see in this upper right hand box. And that's how it's moving food substances through the small intestine. And that the small intestine is responsible for the absorbance of about 90% of that, bit, that burger meal that that guy is eating on that bench. The physiologist, however, is going to say that carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids can all be digested chemically in your small intestine, and that when you break them down, you absorb them across the wall of your small intestine as some very key chemicals. You're going to break down a carbohydrate all the way down to a monosaccharide like glucose and absorb it across the wall. You're going to take a big protein, break them down into peptides, and then you're going to hopefully break it all the way down into amino acids and absorb it across the wall. Whereas fat globules are going to be broken down and then you're going to separate them out into triglycerides and then triglycerides will be broken down so that you absorb the fatty acids and the monoglycerol um, the monoglycerol molecule. And, and so the physiology gets into the nitty gritty function. It talks about the enzymes that you release in the small intestine like brush border enzymes like lactase. You know, you've ever heard of someone who's lactose intolerant? If they're lactose intolerant, they are lacking the lactase enzyme that's sitting on the walls of your small intestine to help break down milk sugar. Now that's a function. But when we just talk about this nice little fuzziness that's all on the wall that's helping you absorb the milk sugar, those, those fuzzy little things are a part of the anatomy. And they're what an anatomist would look at. Okay. We have talked about the basics of anatomy and physiology. Now I want to kind of jump into homeostasis. Homeostasis is this. Homeostasis is your body doing whatever is necessary to stay happy. If you don't remember anything about homeostasis, oh, please remember that. It's when your body does whatever it has to do to stay happy, period, point blank. It wants to stay happy, okay? And it's very important to pay attention to your body's set points. You know, back when I was in school, we learned about set points. and People don't talk about set points the way they used to anymore. Um, set points are your normals. They are certain levels, you know, like, kind of like a car, you know? Your car is supposed to have a certain, you know, when they when you go to get get something done on your car and they say, would you like us to check your 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 fluids and everything on the, on the car? Then what they do is they go in and they check your your oil levels, your coolant levels, they check your you know all your fluids, you know, they check all your basics. And the reason why they're checking that is because those are set points. If your car has all of its set points normal, then it will run well. If it doesn't have all of its set points normal, then there's the possibility that it doesn't run well. You know, your car runs pretty good with some gas in it. You take that gas out of your car, you're going to have some problems. All right? Your car is on E. I don't care if you're in a Jag. I don't care if you're in a Rolls Royce. I don't care if you're in the Bentley. I don't care if you're in the Lexus Coupe. I don't care if you're in the... Uh, I don't care if you are riding down the street in a Lamborghini listening to that Lambo Mercy. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you don't have any gas, you don't have any fuel in that, then your car is going to stop. So homeostasis is the same way. It's talking about the fact that if you don't keep your body at certain levels, then your body is going to stop. And your body stopping is not what you want because your body stopping can lead to uh, your body stopping forever. So here in this slide it says that homeostasis is the body's ability to maintain a relatively stable internal environment in response to changing conditions. I want to point out two things in that line. Don't you ever forget this, okay? Because this is going to help you. It'll help you some in 210. It will help you immensely in 211. And trust me, I haven't been wrong about this one. Two things you need to point out. Number one, a stable internal environment. Your body could care less about what's going on around it. It's just concerned about what's going on in it. If someone's body is having problems and it's responding in a very violent way, it's probably responding in a violent way because it's trying to stabilize its internal environment. Your body doesn't care what's going on down the hall. And your body doesn't care about what's going on downstairs. It only cares about what's going on inside of it. And notice that the second thing that I want to point out 
is in response to changing conditions. Change. It's in response to change. Something changed. And when you change things, your body will have to respond to it. I used to own a cat. And uh, that dude didn't do too well with change. I mean, he never did any, did well with change. I, I promise you. And he would go nuts. You'd go in the room and you'd move his basket around and his water bowl and everything. And that dude would be looking at you. And he'd start getting this look on his face. And his look on his face wasn't anger. It was it was depression. It was, he started pacing the room and looking at you and he started crying and everything. You're like, what's wrong with you, dude? I'm just moving your stuff across the room. He thought you were kicking him out. He didn't do change too well at all. He, he did not. He liked a very complacent pace of life. So needless to say, I think you can guess that he didn't do too well living with me all those years because I'm not the type of person who you know stays still but for so long. I like to be kind of active. Uh, so he, he didn't get used to that ever. He didn't like change. Your body is the same way. Your body doesn't really like a lot of change. So what your body will do is in order to respond to that change, your body will go through a series of processes in order to get its internal environment back to the way it likes it. So in order for your body to be able to do this, your body requires three things to maintain homeostasis. These are three common components, and you're not going to escape this, all right? You're going to you're going to see these components, uh, you're going to see these components in chapter six. Uh, you'll see these components in chapter seven. Then these components will go on hiatus for a while, and then you'll see the components again when we get into uh, the nervous system, talking about the spinal cord and the autonomic nervous system. You'll, you'll, you'll see them again, um, and then when we talk about the special senses. So these three components will make their way on at least two tests, maybe three tests out of this semester. So don't don't sleep on this, all right? And oh, you won't escape this in 211. These three components will be in 211 from the day you start it to the day you end. So three components of homeostasis are receptors, control centers, and effectors. And you got to have these three parts in order to have a, a viable homeostasis. The first part is a receptor, and basically a receptor is anything that can uh, respond to, you know, it, it can respond to a change. That's that's a receptor. It is It is activated due to a change. Kind of like a motion, a motion detector. You know, a motion detector doesn't cut on because the sun comes out. A motion detector doesn't happen because you throw water on it. Uh, a motion detector does not activate just because you yell at it. A motion detector requires a particular type of stimulus, and that stimulus is change. Okay, and the change for a motion detector would be movement. If there's no movement, the motion detector does nothing. If there is movement, then the motion detector is stimulated. Get it? So if I tell you that there's a receptor and it was stimulated, um, then your next question should be twofold. It should be, okay, what was the stimulus and what type of receptor is it? Because if I have a thermal receptor that responds to temperature change, and my body temperature goes up, then that receptor is going to be activated. If I have a chemoreceptor that responds to chemicals, and the pH of my blood drops, it becomes more acidic, then naturally that newly acidic blood is going to stimulate uh, my body to want to do something in response to change. To change. So receptors respond to change, but once you get that change, now you need a control center to put together a plan on how to respond to the change. That's the control center. So the control center processes the incoming information from the receptor in order to put together a plan for how it wants to respond to the change, to the stimulus. That's what a control center is going to do. Typically the control center is either the nervous system or the endocrine system because in the nervous system you're going to respond using nerves, and with the endocrine system, you're going to respond using hormones. And then the last part of the homeostatic system is an effector. And an effector, basically, he 
receives the orders from the control center and actually carries them out. So even though the control center is the brains of the outfit, the effector is the one that carries out. He's the muscle. He's the one that's going to actually do what the control center put together for you to actually carry out. So with that being said, let's look at one more thing and then I'm going to call it quits for the night and we'll come back and we'll make another video later on this week. Notice at the bottom of the screen, response of a homeostatic system occurs through a feedback loop. First there's a stimulus, then that stimulus is detected by the receptor, the receptor then sends a separate signal onto the control center, and then the control center takes that information and then integrates it, processes it, integrates it, and then says, okay, I've come up with an idea to be able to change that stimulus. So I'm going to send a command to the effectors, and then the effectors carry out the command and then return homeostasis back to the land. And that's how your body functions all the time. So let's let's look at something here. You can see where we have a stimulus here. Whoops. You can see up here where we have a stimulus. And basically homeostasis is talking telling us that oh it's too cold. So look at the blue arrow. Blue arrow is going over to the too cold area. So the stimulus here is a change in the variable that is regulated. In this case it's a temperature. So at some point in time, this person's temperature got too cold. That immediately stimulated the receptors. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. how does a receptor get stimulated because it's cold? Well, a receptor is a specialized cell or group of cells that responds to a specific change. So in this case, what they're not showing you is what type of receptor it happens to be. Well, since they're talking about too high, too low, they could be talking about temperature. If they're talking about temperature, then it will be a thermal receptor. And the thermal receptor responds to lower temperatures. And so the thermal receptor will respond to that change in temperature and then send the signal right to that person's child or that person who, who is, you know, or, or whoever is doing the monitoring on that. You know, if you think about, um, if you think about, uh, when you go outside, and you get hot. Okay, you go outside, it's summertime, and you get hot and you start sweating. How did you start sweating? Well, you had temperature receptors that responded to the increased body heat. Those receptors sent a signal to your brain. Your brain processed that information and said, yeah, it's hot. They then take a signal and then they send it on to effectors, and these effectors happen to be sweat glands in your skin and your skin, the sweat glands, relate, release the sweat in order to cool you off. I'll give you another example. I'll use a picture here. See this guy here? He's chopping wood. All right? Now he's chopping wood, and uh, the stimulus is not the wood, and it's not the chopping. Trust me, the stimulus is this hot sun up here, this heat miser. So the sun is beating down on him. He's active. He's chopping the wood. He's being a good boy. He's wearing... Uh, jeans and good protective boots while he's chopping this wood. So it's hot out here, the sun is blazing, he gets an increase in body temperature, notice that his body temperature rises above normal, and because his body temperature rises above normal, the signal is sent to the control center, and the control center says, oh, hold up, I see what's happening here, uh, whoops, it says the control center in the hypothalamus in his brain says, oh, hold up, He's getting too hot, so what we're going to do is we're going to send signals to effectors in his skin, and the skin effectors then in turn uh, happen to be sweat glands, and sweat glands cause him to sweat and allow him to lose heat away from his body so that his body temperature can go back to normal. All right. So we're going to stop right there because I'm pretty sure that's a whole heck of a lot that we've already talked about. And bring us back to this other screen and uh, we'll stop this uh, this particular share here. We'll go back to this. So uh, hopefully you guys got a little something from that. Um, hopefully that wasn't too much. I know I talked really fast. Uh, I'll, you know, you can go back and you can watch it. If you got any questions, hit me with some emails. Um, post some things to me. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish cleaning this video up. I'm going to render it real quick. I'm going to load it on YouTube, and I'm going to send you guys the link so that you can watch it on YouTube. But also, you can watch this video on Google Plus. And uh, if you've never gotten a, if you've never gotten an account on Google Plus, it's easy and it's free. If you have a now the Gmail that we have for school that won't that won't work on Google Plus, all right? Because school doesn't have a license with um, with Google for Google Plus to work. What you'll have to do is you'll have to open up another Google email, and you can just make any any Google email. It's real simple, and it's free. And uh, you'll use that Google email to log into Google Plus, and I can actually add you to the what I call the Bioshack circle. And um, when I add you to the Bioshack circle, you get notifications on your cell phone or your tablet or your computer uh, when I'm doing these videos. You can even join in uh, if you wanted to. Uh, you could have joined in on this video, but like I said, you know, some people are a little shy of the paparazzi because these videos are loaded and on YouTube and they are seen by the general public. So I'm going to stop chatting right now. I'm going to go get me some sleep, give me a snack as well before I go to bed. I will talk to you guys later and hopefully uh, be posting another video pretty soon. See you.